Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Morgan Bazilian. Morgan is the director of the Payne Institute and professor of public policy at the Colorado School of Mines. Previously, he was lead energy specialist at the World Bank. He has over two decades of experience in the energy sector and is regarded as a leading expert in international affairs, policy, and investment. Morgan holds two master's degrees and a PhD in areas related to energy systems and markets and has been a Fulbright Fellow. He holds or has held several affiliations, including at Columbia University, Cambridge University, the Royal Institute of Technology of Sweden, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Morgan is on the editorial boards of Environmental Research Letters, Energy Strategy Reviews, and Energy Research and Social Science. He has published over 140 articles in learned journals. His book, Analytical Methods for Energy Diversity and Security, is considered a seminal piece in the area of energy finance and security. His work has been published in Science, Nature, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Morgan was a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Advisory Council on Energy and on the Global Advisory Council of the Sustainable Finance Program at Oxford University. Previously, he was Deputy Director at the U.S. National Renewable Energy Laboratory and a senior diplomat at the United Nations. Earlier in his career, he worked in the Irish government as principal advisor to the energy minister and was the deputy CEO of the Irish National Energy Agency. He was the European Union's lead negotiator on low carbon technology at the United Nations climate negotiations. He is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Morgan, thank you for being with us this afternoon. It's my pleasure. I'm sorry everyone had to <laughs> sit through my long uh, uh, bio. I don't normally <laughs> like people to read the whole thing. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm uh, honored to be here and, 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 and thank you so much, Linda, for asking me to, to give a short presentation. Um, I listened in on uh, Jim's presentation, which is excellent. I'm going to give a, a very different uh, set of thoughts. I'm going to try to do it in about 15 minutes. Um, and I'm going to look at, uh, so we're now from the detailed picture that you've been given this morning to a, a very high level. So this is a, a 30,000 foot uh, view, as they say, uh, around the geopolitics of the changing energy landscape or the energy transition, as, as some people call it. Um, so I'll just get started. It, you know, most of the people on this call or all of you, you might, might have seen this graph on, on the left. This is um, just the energy system and its development uh, over the last 150 years, looking at both the fuels in the system and the services, uh, the primary services. So through the various industrial revolutions uh, and, and then through the fuels, starting with biomass and coal through oil, gas, hydro, nuclear, et cetera. It's just a, a nice, um, in one place, it's a nice way to look at how the energy system has evolved. Um, and the, the important thing to note here is, is not only the change in services and, and, and fuels, but uh, the non-linearity of that curve, the, 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 the strong upward uh, increasing nature of that curve. And if you look at the, at the graph on the right, I have that same curve roughly uh, starts a little bit earlier, but it's plotted along with uh, the, the minerals and metals that go into the energy system. And you can see not only have they increased, but they've diversified. In other words, there's many more metals and minerals we're using. So these two pieces give you a nice uh, overview of what the energy system roughly looks like today. And and now, you know, the big challenge uh, that's that, that's been put forward around uh, climate change has a very different looking curve. So on this graph, I've, I've, I've um, 
added the red curve. That's the same as you saw previously. That's the historical CO2 emissions. It tracks very well against the, the energy demand or fuels that I showed in the last graph. And then the blue set of curves, uh, scenarios there from uh, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, in their, um, uh, one of their reports, the one around 1.5 uh, C warming over a pre-industrial level. So but, uh, the, the, the key here is, is to say that, you know, they show a set of curves that's never happened before in history, not even close. And so what we see in the red curve is, is, is again, that, that shape we're familiar with in the energy sector uh, rising upward. And now all of a sudden we're confronted with these curves that are, that are doing the exact opposite. And so while this is uh, what's required to, to address uh, climate change and emissions, um, we don't know how to make uh, this curve bend, um, or we haven't done it before. It's technically feasible. It's just that, um, so again, I'll say that again, just because it's important. It is technically feasible to, to, to get in this blue set of curves. The technical bit is not the largest constraint or obstacle, however. It has to do with society and social systems and politics and a lot of other things. So this energy system transition or change in the energy landscape that we've been witnessing um, is often portrayed as a, as a um, transition toward low carbon future. So that's, that's with clean energy systems, um, uh, renewable energy, et cetera. But what I think per, per could perhaps be the, 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 just is equally important, if not more, is that the, the energy changing landscape is actually moving from OECD countries, which are the world's wealthy countries, to developing and emerging economies. So the, 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 the one to look at is the graph on the left, which shows in, in red, the OECD countries, that's the United States, Europe, Australia, Japan, et cetera. Those are flat or decreasing in demand for primary energy. Uh, this is pro projected, but it's, it's been happening anyway. So this is projected from 2016 to 2040, but it's, it's already occurring. And the, the areas in yellow, which are, as you'll recognize, the global south primarily, which is emerging uh, economies of China and India and developing economies in sub-Saharan Africa, and parts of Southeast Asia, that's where all the growth is of energy demand. And along with that growth, is investment and along with that investment and growth is jobs and innovation. And so my takeaway is that this energy transition or this changing energy landscape is largely a developing country story. You could certainly argue that if you like, but not on these facts. Um, I'll just put this up as a, as a sort of, a, as an aside, but there are new ways to monitor monitor this transition and Jim discussed some of them in, 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 in his talk around um, some of the emissions, but we work quite a lot with satellite data where we can see uh, in, in different spectral bands and visible and near infrared and the in instruments we use at the Payne Institute, we can see lights, we can see flares, we can see fires and uh, oddly we can see fishing boats, but I won't go into that. Um, but we've used that for a, a various different ways to look at the changing energy landscape. The graph on the far left is a study we did where we looked at the illegal uh, production of oil by the Islamic State, ISIS, in Syria and Iraq um, a few years ago in 2015, 2016. And then far right um, is, is some work around um, uh, storms that come in and take out uh, a power system. So we can see the change of power systems uh, over time uh, through the lighting. Uh, and then uh, to the second to the right, you can see some of our flaring work. You can see the Permian Basin and the Bakken and pink and the, the lights, obviously. And this, the second from the right is actually not ours. That, that comes from a company called tankertrackers.com, um, which uh, I purchased a $19 uh, monthly subscription, but I just give it to you that you can now see every tanker in the world 
uh, in roughly real time, even if they have their AIS system turned off. So we can monitor the changing energy landscape uh, much more clearly than we used to be able to. All of these things used to be in the purview of the defense apparatus or national intelligence. Uh, that, that's no longer the case. Um, and so we can get them uh, through public data largely. So um, I set out a few years ago to look at the geopolitical contours of the changing energy landscape. That is what's changing between sovereign states because of these changes. And we can look at the changing uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas trade, that's uh, the United States now um, ships or recently shipped uh, LNG to over 30 countries. We have uh, possibly increasing or at least changing issues around cybersecurity with interconnected systems. We have issues around minerals and metals and supply chains and possible conflict. Um, we have issues of interconnected grids and how those relate uh, across boundaries. And of course, we have the issue of inequality. And that is that uh, a billion people don't have access to electricity. Uh, Three billion people don't have access to um, solid, clean uh, fuel for cooking or heating. And, and probably closer to two or three billion have, don't have access to reliable and affordable electricity. So, uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, um, the German government asked uh, me and, and some colleagues to take a look at this, these changes in the energy landscape and, and propose different scenarios uh, that they could use in their own uh, diplomacy and security. So this came from the German Ministry of uh, Security and Foreign Affairs, not from the Energy Ministry. Um, and so we came up with four scenarios. Uh, the, the thing you, I'm sure you all do, but you can keep in mind about scenarios is that they're, they're all wrong. They're, they're, they're not attempting to be correct portrayals of the future. They are highly abstracted in this case. And what we did was we looked at a very simple way. We, we, we just looked at a red curve as fossil fuels and a green curve of renewables. And in four different scenarios showed what we thought might happen to those uh, two uh, fuel type systems uh, in, in different political, socio-political uh, futures. And the, the, the first one is called Big, the Big Green Deal. And let me just, so the Big uh, Green Deal, this is where um, everything goes green and clean. And you can see the fossil fuels peter out and the renewables go go up. Um, this uh, is the goal of, of, of some governments and, and, and certainly would be the best from a climate perspective. Um, but it's not necessarily, it, it's far from the likeliest scenario that we have, especially given how the world is today. And we have other scenarios like dirty nationalism um, that might be closer to um, how we are today and the kind of governments we see we've seen emerge in the United States, in the UK, in Brazil, and elsewhere in, in populism, and in looking at sovereign borders as the goal. So in the words like independence or dominance. Um, and then we have other scenarios where there's different te technology breakthroughs, but certain countries own them like China, or there's muddling on, which is that um, we sort of go uh, like we've been going, roughly. Um, and so, the purpose of these was to inform uh, future pol policy or approaches to diplomacy. Um, and the drivers were um, international policy and technology and markets, et cetera. Um, so I'm not gonna go through each one uh, in, in any detail. This is the big green deal. Uh, this is a wave of green globalization. Um, and we saw low friction geopolitically. At the technology breakthrough, we saw US and China and then non-states like uh, uh, large companies like Google or state companies like the state grid in China emerge as dominant players. And, and then the world fractures into sort of have and have nots. Um, and in that one, you could see something like a clean tech cold war. You know, everything had to be a little overly dramatic for, for, for this uh, particular study. It's actually written up in nature. 
Um, another one was dirty nationalism. And this says elections bring populists to power. That's already happened in, in, in several com countries. Um, and in that way, you see um, climate change as a stress amplifier, but you also see conflict over water and other resources and, 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 and other issues that, that have been building up. And muddling on, again, um, the unit cost for renewables keep declining, but fossils remain dominant, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, there's different um, takeaways we, we took out of each of these for different regional implications. Of course, again, they're all wrong, but they were just to, to, to sort of inform uh, uh, high level thinking. So here's a, a look at the, the different scenarios. And again, we can see this in the, in the paper in Nature, if you're more interested. Uh, we looked at the pace of change. I think this is a really important one. Um, whether it's fast or slow and even or stalled and uneven, that has a lot of implications for politics. Um, the international political architecture here, that, that's more of an international relations um, um, set of vocabulary, whether it's clubs or hegemony or zero sum games and anarchy, et cetera. And what happens to uh, climate change uh, and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So some key takeaways. Um, a zero carbon world, so that's that green, green, green one, does not do away with zero sum games. It just produces different ones. So the, the assumption that because we have a clean, green energy system um, does not mean that we will be without geopolitical stressors. Um, and that a global win-win is, is but one plausible outcome, and in our view, not the most likely. The pace of change, as I alluded to, matters. So if there's a very fast change, um, say from fossils to clean energy, you will certainly have um, some geopolitical rifts occurring in large producing countries with national oil companies, uh, as an example. And you may have some economic um, depressions and things like that happening in the, those countries, especially if they don't have governance systems in place or that their economies are not diversified, which in a lot of cases they are not. Um, so so it, no matter what happens, again, abating, uh, focusing just on the climate change or just on the clean, um, it will create losers and, and winners, of course. So we have to prepare for that, just different losers and winners. And that, that I say that from a, a, a sovereign state uh, uh, perspective, a socioeconomic perspective. Um, this, I think the second one is probably the most important. It's easy to say draw lessons from par past and parallel experiences, but it's not so often done. But the, the middle one, this shifting from goals to pathways, I think is the most poignant of it, which says it's very easy politically to come up with long-term goals out to say 2050. It is much more difficult and you have to address many more trade-offs when you look at short-term pathways and how to design them. So I think that's the, the main takeaway from, from my short presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions as Linda likes, either uh, now or, or on the Q&A and uh, in the chat function, which I believe I can see. And um, I also uh, am going to be on a panel, I believe, at 1 o'clock or 1 o'clock mountain time, um, that is. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for having me, Linda. It's my pleasure and an honor to be here. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Morgan. So we'll open it up for questions uh, in the, uh, the chat or verbally. So, so I, I, see, I see one uh, from Patrick. Have you modeled energy transition scenarios since COVID-19? How do you believe it accelerated to delay pace of change? Well, of course, that's the million dollar question, Patrick. Um, uh, I have not done new formal scenarios since COVID-19, but I have worked on probably about seven different P 
pieces that looked at different parts of this. So we looked at, as an example, uh, what's been happening in the LNG market. So the oil market is well, well considered and written up. I also looked at uh, oil field services and labor jobs in, in the oil sector. We looked at supply chain issues for solar photovoltaic. Uh, we looked at supply chain issues for battery uh, minerals and metals um, and about three or four other things, which I'm gonna forget off the top of my head, but we do have a COVID-19 and energy webpage now up at the Payne Institute. So if you go to payneinstitute.minds.edu, we have a special page um, with all the work. There's, there's at least 20 or 30 pieces up there now um, that look at the impacts or influence of, of the pandemic on the energy system.